Time for a little honesty this morning. How many of you out there have ever had a Big Mac? There you go. You see the youth were like, oh, me, me. Two hands go up real quick, real quick. The Big Mac is one of those infamous burgers, and it's been around for more than 50 years. I don't mean the same sandwich. I mean the, the, how they make the sandwich has been around, been around for 50 years, and it probably could last even longer with all those preservatives. But anyhow, um, today it is still one of the most popular items on the McDonald's menu. In fact, it's so popular that the Big Mac has its own jingle. Do any of you know the song for the Big Mac? Do you remember it? Do you remember that one? Okay, you ready? One, two, three. Two all beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. Very good. Give yourself a round of applause. That might have been a little generational. So I'm not sure some of those who have not yet learned how to drive know that one. So we might be showing some of our age. Yes, two all beef patties. Mmm, special sauce. Lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions. Mmm. Mmm. You know, the truth about the Big Mac is that it, it really isn't that much different from any other burger, actually. But what makes it extremely special is that special sauce. When that burger was first introduced, a special sauce was actually called secret sauce. And then in 1974, when they developed that jingle, they changed it to, to special sauce. And to this day, that special sauce is hidden from public knowledge. In fact, to, to prevent the employees from stealing the secret recipe, I heard they have to sign a non-disclosure statement <laughs> when they start working there. I've heard that the secret sauce actually comes to each restaurant in a tightly sealed container under tight security. One time, one of the chefs from McDonald's actually went on YouTube and created the special sauce, but left out how much of each ingredient. And then he used vague terms like, add the herbs, add the spices, some of this and some of that in a container. We had no idea what it was but you could almost taste it watching the video. Needless to say, McDonald's has been very, very serious when it comes to protecting the secret in their special sauce. Well, you know, like Big Mac and the special sauce, living a life as a follower of Christ for some of us can also seem mysterious and vague. We're not quite sure what's inside this thing we call a faith-filled life. Sometimes it seems like it might be too difficult or it might be unclear or it might be vague for us. And some of us even believe that living a full life of God is, is something that we can never obtain. It's, it's highly technical. It's too narrow of a path for our lives. It's, it's a closely guarded secret that only the most holy and the most trained could ever have the privilege of actually knowing. Do any of you remember, and this is another generational question, Nemus Marcus cookies? They were a secret. You could go to the store and get them, but they would never give out the recipe. And I don't know, is Verna here this morning? There she is. Have any of you asked Verna for her secret sausage gravy recipe? She won't give it to you. <laughs> it's a secret. But you know, a lot of chefs have some kind of secret recipe that they're known for. And they keep that recipe locked away in a recipe box or well guarded in their memory so that it will always be with them. You know, sometimes we think God is kind of like that. Sometimes we think that's God's attitude towards the blessings that we have in our lives. And we think it's some kind of big secret. But this could not be further from the truth. Instead, God has given us very clear instructions, a foolproof recipe for living a life that is connected to him. Our Bible is filled with words of guidance. It's filled with ways that you can live a life that's connected to him. But one of the places where this is found most clearly is in the Apostle Peter's letter, which Tina read for us. And Peter, when he's writing this, he's writing to the very early church. We call this the infant church. 
And he's encouraging the people of that gathering of the church, how to, and he's trying to guide them. He's trying to help them to grow in their faith and to help them become all that God wants them to be. So again, in this Second Peter, in verse 3 and 4, he wrote this. He said, by his divine power, the Lord has given us everything we need for life. Everything we need for life, God has already given us. And he's given us this through the knowledge of the one who called us through the knowledge of the one who who called us by his own power and by his own glory. And that through God's power and glory, he has given us precious and wonderful promises. And these precious, wonderful promises that he has given to us, we may share in the divine nature of God through those. And through that power and through that gift, you and I can then escape from the world's immorality. So in other words, Peter is telling everyone who's listening to his letter while it's being read in church, he says, don't spend your time feeling like you weren't given the secret code. Don't spend your time thinking you don't have the secret handshake that everyone else does. Don't spend your time thinking that somehow you were left out And you're the only one who doesn't know. Peter says, don't be tricked into thinking like that. Adam and Eve were tricked into thinking something like that. But don't you. Don't even think that somehow God is holding something back from you and that you don't know. He says, you are already equipped. You already have what it takes to live the life that God wants you to live. And then he gets really forward in this letter. He says, look, you've already got it. God's divine power. It's been placed inside each and every one of you. As you sit here this morning, you are filled with God's divine power. All we have to do is awaken it in us and make it active. One thing I want you to know this morning is that you have all the ingredients for faith already in you. Now, during the time that Peter was writing this letter, there was was another group of people, a subsect of people, and they were called Gnostics. And the Gnostics used to brag a lot. They bragged that they had some sort of secret knowledge above above anyone else, that above any well-trained religious scholar. They had knowledge that was above the most sacred teachings of the church. And if you didn't have their knowledge, well, then you were just deluded. You weren't as good. You weren't as faithful. Can you see how having this, this idea, the way it would permeate into your teachings through other people, that somehow you had something that you were withholding from others, that you were controlling it, that everyone wasn't entitled to this. And you can see how this would lead towards false teachings. Because when it comes to the sovereignty of Christ's death and resurrection, it was made for everyone. Everyone. It was not made for humanity to control it. It wasn't made for a group to control it. Christ's salvational act was done for everyone. Period. Have you ever been in your kitchen one day and you started to make dinner or lunch or you're preparing something to take to a friend's house or maybe to go to a barbecue and and as you're whipping everything up, you realize, I don't have all the ingredients. Right? I don't have that strange ingredient that I need. I don't have that one thing that we should always have. Or like me, you open up the milk and go, woo, no. Well, there are some substitutions you can use. And these, some of these substitutions I've used, and, and they're really good. You can use applesauce instead of oil or eggs when you're baking. Did you know that? Did you know that you can use fat-free yogurt instead of sour cream? It's very good for you. Did you know that you can use mashed bananas instead of sugar? It's very good for you. 
And then, of course, there's one that I would never in my life ever use. There was dried fruit instead of chocolate chips. I think I would stop making whatever it was and go to the store. But there are some things that we can substitute for other things in a recipe. And and I want to tell you that instead of waiting or wishing that you could get something you think you don't have, you already have everything you need to live a faith-filled life. You don't have to wait for anything. God has already given you everything that you need. Peter tells us that through faith in Jesus Christ, we have all the tools, we have all the ingredients that we need to love God and serve others, to overcome the sins of the world, to grow spiritually in our lives, and to live a faith-filled life. You know, here at First Church, we have a mission statement, and that mission statement is to love God, love others, serve others, and grow deeper to do good in the world. To love God, to love others, to serve others, and to grow deeper. Now, many churchgoers, maybe even some faith novices, or possibly even some Christ followers, we, we become you know, a little frustrated because we think that there's more that we need. We think that somehow God didn't give us all the ingredients, and so it's up to us to fill in the missing parts. We forget to rely upon the the promise of God in his love and in his grace. And instead, we think there's somehow that we ourselves have to be more or we have to do more. Brothers and sisters, I want you to hear me this morning and I want you to hear me very clearly when I say to you that you already have everything that you need. Quit relying upon your own strength. Quit relying upon your own energy. Quit relying upon your own intelligence. Begin to understand that trusting in the power of God that is already inside of you is a power that will transform you. It's a power that will lead you to equipping you to do what you've been called to do. It will strengthen you to give you the energy that you need to do. It will guide you to make the decisions you need to make. It will support you as you continue to move forward. And it's all ready inside of you. Peter continues in this second letter in verse 5. And he says, add goodness to your faith and to goodness, knowledge and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, endurance, and to endurance, godliness, and to godliness, affection for others, and to the affection for others, love. Almost sounds like he's trying to bake a cake, doesn't it? To your pan, add the flour and add the eggs and add the butter, right? It's a great recipe. And he says the very first ingredient that we add is goodness. Goodness. The word he uses in Greek is arete. Arete is an active word. It means that there's movement and motion. It means more than just someone who, who avoids doing the, the wrong things. It means someone who exhibits virtues and moral excellence. Someone who exhibits those things that appear to come from an authority a higher power. That's what virtue means. It's like when you do something, even though you're obligated to do it, you do it with joy in your heart. You do it with the happiness of knowing that you're doing what you've been called to do. You're doing it even though maybe you have to sacrifice because you're doing it for the joy of the Lord. That's a moral excellence. And it's an active word. And so that means Peter's calling us to add to our faith action, intentional acts of pure goodness in the world. Acts that are a blessing to others. Acts that go without any kind of own personal gain and notoriety. Peter says goodness is the first ingredient to a full and meaningful life. So we want you to know that you have all of the ingredients for faith. And the second thing we want you to know is that you were created to do good. 
The Apostle Paul, he, he picks up on this when he writes a letter to the church in Ephesus. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, he, he wrote this. He says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is a gift from God. Not by work so that no one can boast. For you and I, we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God already prepared for us to do in advance. Meaning God knew you were coming and God equipped you before you came and he called you to come to do the good works. Paul said, we don't do good works to earn favor. We do good works in response to God's gift of salvation. God made you and I part of his whole universal plan. God knew you before you were in your mother's womb. God knew the universe before we did. And God planned it out. And he designed you in such a way to do good works. How do we find all of these good works that are supposedly waiting for us? How do we discover these these opportunities Well, theologian Frederick Bucher, he he once said these words, the place that God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness meets the world's deepest hunger. The place where God called you to is the place where your deep gladness meets the world's deepest hunger. It's no secret that God wants you to to discover how to use your faith life, to use the goodness that you've been given. It's no secret. And you can begin by asking yourself just a couple of questions, just a few questions. What are you good at? Or even better yet, what do other people say that you're good at? Ask your family and your friends and your coworkers. What are you passionate about? Meaning, what is something that you feel most alive when you're doing? What do you have to offer the world? And another question is, what needs do you see? What needs do you see in your family, in your community, in your workplace? As you answer these questions and as as these answers start to come up inside of you, you're going to discover ways in which God already designed you. You're going to discover ways that you can bring goodness into the world. And so you already have the ingredients for your faith. You were created to do good. And third, you need to start cooking. You need to start acting. You need to move. No good chef wastes time in the kitchen. They know that there's a a lot to accomplish. There's a lot of prep. There's a lot of things that have to happen to make a recipe happen. Time is critical in getting that into the oven and out of the oven and cooling just right. Brothers and sisters, let's not waste any more time than we already have. You know, almost 20 years ago, Almost 20 years ago, I, I sat down with a friend of mine, a mentor, Pastor Bob. And I said to Pastor Bob, you know, I, church just isn't for me. I, I go to church, I sit there, I leave, I feel even more empty than when I got there. I have done everything in the church. I, I've done every chairperson position. I've sat on every leadership team. I was part of a capital campaign. We fixed the stained glass windows. We fixed the organ. We got new carpet. I said, you know, I, there's, there's just nothing left for me. I'm done. Maybe in a couple of months, I'll be able to come back. And he looked me right in the face and he said, Tom, you haven't done everything. And I looked back at him and I said, oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. I went to seminary that fall and I took one class. 
begrudgingly. The next I took two, the next I was a full-time student. Five years later, nights, weekends, evenings, you know, all that kind of stuff, I graduated. Now let me tell you, I, I had never been to Bible college before. I never got an award for attending Sunday school. God has equipped you to do what he has already laid out for you to do. We just have to put it in action. You need to start cooking. You need to start moving. You know, sometimes we just need to ask the right people. What am I, what am I good at? Where are my gifts and graces? What excites me? What do I say no to but can't wait to get up and do? We also have the best example in the world to follow. Jesus. Jesus set the best example. He knew the reason he had come to this earth. He lived his life with incredible intention because he knew that. He fed the hungry. He healed the sick. He ate with sinners. And he told everyone else about the good news of the coming of Christ's kingdom. The apostle John, he quoted Jesus in his scriptures. In chapter 6, verse 38, John wrote this as Jesus was speaking. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Whose will are you following? we got to start cooking. We have to begin today, here and now, working on a new recipe for life. And we have to begin by adding goodness. So I have a question for you. What is the one thing that you can do to bring some goodness into this world? What is the one thing that you can do to bring some good into this world? What is the one thing that you can do today? And what is the one thing that you can do tomorrow to bring some good into this world? And pray. Pray for for God to give you opportunities and then take full advantage of all of them. It's not a secret sauce. It's not a secret recipe. It's a life filled with meaning and purpose. It's a life that God wants for you. And it's a life that's available to everyone as we bring goodness into the world.